So first warning, uh, uh, the time slot says one hour, but actually uh, what we discussed with Lucas that uh, it's better to have a bit more flexibility in the timing. So how, how long do you plan for? Me, so I think, I think, I, I think ar around one hour, yeah, one hour, one hour 15 okay. maybe, yeah. Okay, so welcome everyone. That's uh, our new feature of the colloquium series. And I'm glad that uh, a lot of people came by. Um, so the idea is that uh, this afternoon we will have uh, uh, an expert talk. And that's why this morning we have uh, another expert who will explain <laughs> so, and will make us more ready for the, the main event. And I think more than that, uh, uh, it's, it's a good opportunity for, for students to, to have a more uh, kind of relaxed talk and then feel free to ask questions. It's, it's good if, if you just learn some basics and then maybe still... Uh, uh, you don't have to be feel prepared for the next talk, but just uh, learn something. Uh, let me also use the opportunity to invite everyone in general to attend the colloquium talks, which are supposed to be also uh, aimed for students in general, even if we don't have this special pre-talk. It's good to attend some colloquiums, colloquia. Uh, and I'm glad you, everyone is here. So today we have uh, Lucas Kaufman, and uh, he's from Singapore. Uh, he's uh, working in complex dynamics. And actually, maybe uh, so. <laughs> uh, Lucas' biography is actually more interesting. He is from Brazil, and he did his PhD in Paris. He was in Sweden. And next stop is Korea. So <laughs> you can ask him about all these places. Uh, OK, uh, go ahead. Thank you. OK, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the, the very kind invitation. I'm glad to speak in uh, Israel, even though I'm, I'm not physically there, with, which would, would be nice. And I'm also uh, honored to be the first uh, pre-colloquium speaker. <laughs> So yeah, so the, as uh, Max uh, told, uh, I'll, I'll speak about basic, uh, basic facts and basic notions on, on complex dynamics and uh, mainly how uh, pluripotential theory or currents uh, appear uh, very fundamentally in, in this theory. And hopefully this will at least uh, give you some, some idea of what kind of ob objects uh, are, are used in, in research in this area and then hopefully it will make it easier to understand next talk. So the talk will be uh, not very technical. I hope that I try to do it, a uh, non-technical talk, but please stop me at any time uh, you, you want, either in the chat that I can see here or uh, unmuting yourself. Okay, so that's the goal uh, of the talk. Uh, I divided in uh, roughly three parts. The first part, I will tell you what is complex dynamics, so what is about, what is the main, what are the main questions and main things that we we look for in, in complex dynamics. The second part, I'll talk about pluripotential theory, which is a branch of several variable uh, complex analysis. Uh, which is very useful in, in complex dynamics. And in the third part, I will make these two words meet and I'll, I'll show you how pluripotential theory and more specifically uh, currents appear in the study of, of complex dynamics, focusing on, on two uh, kinds of examples, endomorphisms of projective space and uh, laminations by, by remote surfaces. Okay. Okay, so first of all, very basic and vague uh, definition. So uh, what is a dynamical system? So we start with a space X that for now is just a space, no extra structure. And a dynamical system on this space is just a model, a mathematical model of points moving in this space. Okay, so we can model physical uh, movement or uh, biological or mathematical uh, objects that, that behaves like points moving in a space. 
So maybe you have already encountered some examples in your uh, mathematical life. So I'll give here just uh, two uh, different uh, types of uh, dynamical system. They can be roughly divided into different uh, families. Uh, the first one are the discrete dynamical systems, and the other one is uh, continuous dynamical system. Okay, so let's start with the discrete one. So a discrete dynamical system is given by um, given by a map. So we start with a with a map from a space to itself, and then the dynamics is given by composing this map with itself n times. Okay, so let me draw a picture here. So we have a space x. And then we have uh, the dynamics, which looks more or less like this. We start with a point X, and then we apply our map once. We get a new point F of X. And then we do that uh, again. And then we get F square of X, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's the dynamical system. For every point of the space, we have a, a sequence of points in this space. Okay. So here the dynamics is given by, by this index n. So the time here, the role of time is played by the uh, natural numbers, which is this n. Okay. And if the map is invertible, so if you can take f minus one, we can also take negative powers of, of f. So the time can also be uh, z if you want, okay? So that's one type of dynamical system. The other type is are the continuous ones. So we have our space here, X, and we have now a continuous movement. So we have, for instance, a vector field, and for every point, we can consider its, its flow with respect to this uh, vector field. And we can take different starting points and look at how they behave. They can do something like this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So these are two... Uh, different uh, types of, of system that we, we can look at. And then the questions that, that we ask are, are more or less the same for every dynamical system that we encounter in mathematics and even in nature. So the typical questions are, are the following. Well, what is the asymptotic behavior of the system? So what happens when N is very big or when the time here is, is very long? So do, do the orbits accumulate somewhere? Uh, what is the limiting behavior? Can we say something about it? A second important question is, is uh, what are the invariant objects? For instance, what are the fixed points, uh, invariant points, invariant measures, invariant functions, etc. Another thing that is uh, quite uh, interesting to know is uh, whether our system is sensitive to initial data or not. So if we start with a point and we know exactly uh, what happens with its behavior, can we say something about nearby points? So it can happen that the nearby points behave very similarly to the, to the starting point, or they can have a very different behavior. So the system can be chaotic. Uh, we can also ask about uh, how uh, the system behave when we change parameters. So if you perturb the, the function F, or if you perturb the vector field, does the dynamics change drastically or not? Do we have like rotations, stability, et cetera? And, Finally, which is, I think, the most interesting for this talk, is this is where uh, potential theory, pure potential theory is very useful in, in complex dynamics. What is the statistical description of, of the orbits? So typically, most of the dynamical systems, or at least the ones that are interesting, are very chaotic. So we cannot say with infinite precision what is the orbit of a given point. So it's uh, hopeless to, to describe precisely the orbit of a given point. So Instead of that, we, we try to, to describe what is the probability that this point uh, does something that we, that we want to know. So for instance, if you, if you take a box or a set in, in our space, so how many, how, what is the portion of the orbits that stay in this, in this box, for instance, and uh, do, do the orbits uh, accumulate uh, in, in, in some probabilistic sense in some set, et cetera. Okay. What is a foliation? Sorry for the ignorance. Yeah, so I will, I will maybe explain this later, but it's a higher dimensional generalization of vector field. So for a vector field, you have a point and a direction. A foliation, you have a point and a higher dimensional set of directions. For instance, you have, you have a tangent plane at each direction. Is that clear? 
So each foliation defines you some uh, flow. It, yeah, and now and here the space is is not R but R two, R three, or it's the dimension of the foliation. Okay, yeah, I didn't write this, so it's maybe a good thing to to write here. So here the time is a continuous time, right? It's R, or maybe it can be some higher dimensional R D or C, etc. Okay. Okay, so that's very vaguely what a dynamical system is. So this is a, a very general definition, right? We have a space and, and a map in the space, etc. So when you put when you put more structure in the space, we have more structure on, on the dynamics as well. So that's what we are going to do now. So a complex dynamical system is uh, is a dynamical system defined on on a complex manifold, sorry, on a complex manifold, and where the objects involved, the, the vector fields and the maps are holomorphic. So before continuing, let me define what a, what a complex manifold is. A complex manifold is a topological space that is modeled locally on open sets of CK. Just as real manifolds are obtained by gluing pieces of open sets of, of Euclidean space, a complex manifold is a, is a space obtained by gluing uh, pieces of open sets of CK. So let me draw a picture here. So we have our space here, X, a topological space. And then it is a complex manifold if you can cover it by, by open sets that are biholomorphic to open sets on CN, on CK. Okay. And such that the ambiguity, so the, the change of, of coordinates uh, that passes from one open set to the other open set is a holomorphic map. Okay, is that clear? So it's a space obtained by gluing pieces of, of open sets of CK in a holomorphic way. So basic examples are, of course, CK itself, it's naturally a, a complex manifold, complex tori, which are quotients of CK by, by some set of translations. Uh, another important example that I would describe here is uh, projective space. So what is uh, projective space? The definition of projective space of dimension K is the set of all directions uh, emanating from the origin in CK plus one. So for each direction in CK plus one, we have one point in projective space, or it can be also seen as this uh, quotient of CK plus one mod multiplication by non-zero non scalars, okay? And why is that interesting? So first of all, the one dimensional uh, projective space, which is called also projective line, is just the one point compactification of C. So it's the, the Riemann sphere, the sphere with, with the natural complex structure. And also interesting, uh, we have um, uh, inductive uh, representation of projective space. So the projective space PK, it's obtained by CK plus one by adding a copy of a lower dimensional projective space. So we have a compactification of, of CK that is, is natural in, in, complex, in complex analysis. So the way we see this, so we, we start in, in CK and then for each direction that we look at infinity, we add, we add uh, one point. So this, this is why I call this a symmetric compactification of CK. And this is the most natural compactification that we can hope in, in, in complex manifold theory because the, the naive compactification just by adding one point like here, it doesn't work. It only works in dimension one. In, in higher dimension, we won't get in general complex manifold. So this is in some sense the, the most important compact complex manifold, okay? And one notation that we will use uh, in the SQL uh, we will denote the line through a given point in CK plus one, so a, a equivalence class in this quotient by this notation here, this bracket notation, and we call it homogeneous coordinates. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's move on. So I define a, a complex manifold, so our spaces will be complex manifolds. If you still don't like the, the name complex manifold, you can, for the rest of the talk, think of either CK, which is very easy to understand, or this uh, 
PK that I just defined. Okay. Or if you don't understand even PK, you can just think a, a natural compactification of CK. Okay, so now I define uh, the space, what is this complex space, and now what is the complex dynamical system? So there are two main classes of, of dynamical systems that I want to stress. The first one is a polynomial map. So the map that we are iterating is defined uh, in the complex numbers, and it's a polynomial function. Okay. And this is very, very classical subject. So the, the theory of iteration started uh, 100 years ago by Fatou, Julia, et cetera, and, and it is a highly, highly developed field in mathematics and still active. So this is a one-dimensional uh, complex dynamics. And uh, another important uh, class of examples are given by polynomial maps, but now defined on, on PK. So if you take uh, homogeneous polynomials of the same degree, and you take uh, one for each coordinate, this gives a polynomial uh, dynamical system, but now defining this uh, complex space here. So the advantage here is that now we have a dynamics in, in a complex space, which for some reasons is more natural or easier to, to handle. Okay, uh, I'm getting a feeling that I'm spending more than one hour 15, if that's okay for you just to like to prevent you, yeah. But if you want me to stop, just, just tell me I can, I can stop. Okay, so let me just give a, uh, a classical and easy example to understand, and then we, we then this will be uh, a guiding principle, or at least we'll show some, some basic uh, phenomena that can occur. And, and the example is this one, the map, the polynomial map fz gives uh, z squared. So this is one of the rare instances where we can say, describe explicitly the dynamics. In, in general, we cannot do this, but in this very simple example, we, we can describe ex explicitly. So for instance, what happens if we start with a point uh, outside the unit circle? So if you start with a point here outside the, the unit disk, sorry, the modulus is bigger than one. So when we take the square, it will be even bigger. And then we take the square will be even bigger and bigger and bigger. So the orbits outside the, the unit disk will diverge to, inf to infinity. So the dynamics is very boring and, and easy to understand. Every point goes to infinity. So infinity is a, an attracting fixed point for this dynamical system. And inside the disk is, is this uh, symmetric situation, right? If we start with any point inside the disk and we iterate, it will rotate towards the, the the origin, right, depending on the argument. So outside the unit disk, everything is uh, trivial. Inside the, the unit disk is in the open unit disk, everything is trivial. And then the interesting dynamics uh, happens exactly in the in the circle, right? So for instance, if we start with a, with a, with the point one, it's obviously fixed. But if you start with a point that have a small angle here, then you will drift away. And then it will come back to one or not, depending if the angle is rational or not, but this is quite uh, quite easy to, to describe, okay? And then you, you, you see that uh, we have a, a dense set here of, of fixed points. Okay. So the dynamics is quite straightforward. And then one extra thing that I would like to mention here is uh, an equidistribution uh, result for this map that I will uh, generalize later. So. Imagine that we start with a, with a point anywhere, inside the unit disk, outside, etc. Just to simplify, let's start with the point uh, here, four. Okay. So what are the pre-images of this point? The pre-images are uh, two and minus two. Right. And then we take the pre-images again, we will have a square root of two, minus the square root of two, and then the complex roots as well, right? Sorry for the bad handwriting. And then if you keep doing this, you realize that all the pre-images will, uh, will accumulate from the outside on the unit circle. Okay. And if you do this inside the disk, it, it also happens the same. If you take a point here, all the pre-images will accumulate on the unit, on its circle. So, we say that the, the pre-images converge to 
the Haar measure on the unit circle. So the Haar measure on the unit circle is a canonical uh, measure for this dynamical system. It's a canonical environment measure for the dynamical system. So, so you're just here, defining some new dynamics by taking kind of the inverse of the function? Yes, you can see this as a generalized dynamics, or you can see this the, the prehistory of, of the dynamics. And we see that the 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 unit, the hard measure on the unit circle is, is a canonical measure for the dynamical system. Okay, I'll, I'll come back uh, to this later. And this set is, is a famous set, it's called the Julia set of, of, of the system. Okay, and here we have two uh, exceptions. So if you start anywhere, we have this, uh, this uh, behavior, except if you start at zero, then we stay at zero forever. And we, if we start at infinity, we always stay at infinity forever. But with these two exceptions, everything converges to, to the hard measure in the unit circle, okay? And just to put a nice uh, picture that you may be seeing somewhere, uh, related to, the, to the, this dynamics or more specific to this family of dynamical systems, we have this nice picture of the Mandelbrot set, which is related to, to the stability of this, this family of dynamical systems. Okay. Just to give us a definition that it matters, but the, the black part here is the set of parameters C such that the origin uh, has a bounded orbit. And this set has a very, very rich structure and it's very uh, well studied, but still there are some big conjectures uh, about the structure of this set. So what, okay. the, what do the colors mean again? Sorry? What do the colors on the picture, on the picture mean again? I don't know. <laughs> so the black, <laughs> the black is the bounded one. So the, the black part is the, is the set of parameters C for which uh, zero is, has a bounded orbit. And then why, here, why, here I think why, it's why did you the, see like from Z because at, at zero it's very simple and then yeah so in all these regions it's I mean the dynamic is not simple but but you, you can for instance in this black part here the Julia sets are all always connected so more or less similar to this one but, but can you see them somehow if you you take a limit of C to zero then you can no no so that's the whole point of bifurcation theory so you you, you it's, in some sense, the, the dynamics behave more or less continuously in this black part, but then the, bif the, the boundary, which is uh, the interesting part, is where we have bifurcation. So where, to where the dynamics is like, uh, uh, changes drastically when we, when we cross this, this border. Okay. But this will be a whole new talk and, uh, and also it's not my expertise, but I'd just like to, to show that these nice fractals appear uh, and are very interesting just by considering very simple dynamical system. I had a poster of this at, uh, at my room when I was a kid. <laughs> uh -huh. Really? Okay. <laughs> so now you know a little bit more about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there any questions or can I move on? Okay, so this is... Uh, I have a small question about the previous slide. Can you explain, yes. what, can you explain what is a holomorphic transition function? Uh, yes, the well, there are many, many different ways, but basically it's differentiable in the complex uh, sense. For instance, in one dimensional complex analysis, we have this definition of differentiability over C, and here is the same. Oh, okay, thank you. Another way of seeing, you, you can see this is a map from R2K to R2K, and it, it is holomorphic if the, the Jacobian matrix is C linear. Okay. Way of seeing this. Okay. Okay. So now we get to pluripotential theory. So first of all, why we care about pluripotential theory? The first uh, thing is that the classical tools in one-dimensional complex dynamics are Montel's theorem about uh, normal families, uh, the Riemann mapping theorem that says that every simply connected domain in C is biholomorphic to the ball. This is a fundamental result of Riemann, and also the theory of quasi-conformal maps that uh, I won't talk about it. But my main point here is that in, in higher dimensions, uh, we're in really bad shape because we don't have a Montel's theorem. We, we don't have a natural uh, Montel's theorem. Uh, we don't have at all the Riemann mapping theorem. 
So we have simply connected domains that are not the ball. And uh, we don't have the theory of quasi conformal maps. Okay. So in, in higher dimension, uh, holomorphic maps are, are not conformal. So we cannot talk about conformal maps and, and let alone quasi conformal. Okay. So we were in bad news if you want to just adapt the tools from one dimensional dynamics to higher dimension. But the good news is that we have a very nice theory that works very well, which is uh, the aim of this talk is uh, called pluripotential theory. So this uh, theory uh, is, uh, was founded uh, independently and more or less at the same time by uh, Pierre Long and Kiyoshi Oka in around 1950s. And it's the higher dimensional uh, analog of classical potential theory, the theory of Laplace equation and, and potential functions, electrostatics, et cetera. And the main objects that I will introduce uh, in a minute are plurisubharmonic functions and positive closed currents. And also I won't talk about it, but the motion pair operator is also an important object here. Okay. So what, what do these things you erased, what, what do they more or less? Yeah, so maybe let me- What do we lose? What is Montel's theorem for example? Yeah, so let me erase you because it's, yeah. So Montel theorem is, yeah. So if you have a function that omits three points, a sequence of a family of functions that omits three values, it's automatically compact. We can extract uh, converging subsequences, etc. This is not true exactly in, in higher dimensions. So we have uh, good notions of, of hyperbolicity that replace these, but it, they're hard to check and hard to, to work with. So we have some sort of Montel theorem, but they're, they're not as useful as in dimension one. But the other two are really fail miserably in, in higher dimensions. So the Riemann map, mapping theorem is, is wrong. For instance, the by disk and the disk are not biholomorphic to each other. This is the, the easiest example of, of, of failure of the Riemann mapping theorem. And the third point is that is the lack of conformality for, for holomorphic functions. In, in one complex variable, every holomorphic function is automatically conformal but this is not true in higher dimensions. So that's not just about dynamics. You're talking about general complex. General complex analysis, yes, yes. So pluripotential theory is, is also a main tool in, in, in complex analysis because many things fail in higher dimensions. So yeah, when you, when you go from real analysis to complex analysis, many things change. Uh, the situation is much more rigid. And then when you go from one complex animation to higher complex animation, also it's drastically different. So many, many things that hold in one dimension doesn't hold in, in higher dimensions. Okay. Which is bad news in one sense, but very good news in the other sense because it, it forces us to think of other ways of doing stuff and gives rise to very nice theories. Okay. Okay, so now we end the first part of, of the talk and uh, we get to hopefully well motivated to the second part. So what is uh, pluripotential theory? So I'll try to be a bit quicker because I'm maybe too slow. <laughs> so let's start with the, the one dimensional uh, setting. So what is a subharmonic function? So we start with the open set in T and we take a function that takes values in R and possibly uh, minus infinity is also allowed. Okay, and then we say that a function is subharmonic if it's upper semi, sub semi continuous and has this very nice property that it has this sub mean value property. So, what is that? Is it means that well, we have here your, your domain. So, if you take any point in your domain A and any disk around it, the value at A is, is smaller or equal than the, the average on the neighbors of this point. Okay. So if you remember harmonic functions is when we have equality here. So this is a generalization of harmonic functions. So we have, instead of having the mean value property, we have the sub mean value property, okay? So that's the definition. And here are the main properties of such functions. The first one is that we can uh, detect, if, a if the function is smooth, we can detect whether it's subharmonic by looking at its, Lap its Laplacian. So if, if the Laplacian is a positive non-negative function, the function is subharmonic if and only if, okay? 
The second point here is the generalization for non necessarily smooth uh, subharmonic functions. We still have these characteriz characterizations, but now we have to look at this Laplacian as a generalized function, as a distribution. So, if you recall from the theory of distributions, what this means, it, it means that if you pair uh, the weak Laplacian uh, with a test function chi, which is by definition this pairing here, which is also by definition this integral here. The function would be subharmonic if this is a positive uh, number for every positive non-negative test function. Okay, so the function is subharmonic either if it's smooth or not. If and only if we have this uh, positivity in the sense of, of distributions. Okay, and uh, also a very important uh, property for us is that this notion is invariant by holomorphic change of coordinates. So if you take a holomorphic map. Since we have this invariance of the Laplacian up to a positive uh, scalar, or positive function, the fact that this is positive is equivalent uh, to the fact that this is positive or, or no negative. Okay, so why is this uh, uh, important? Because now we can we can define this in any complex manifold, one-dimensional complex manifold. Because we look in local coordinates, and since we have this invariance, it doesn't matter which uh, local coordinate we we choose. Okay. Uh, is that clear? Is, is, it, is, is it, sorry, is it enough to know that function is so subharmonic for only for small uh, circles around points, and then we can conclude that it is subharmonic for large circles, or is it not true? Because if not, then you have the problem with the gluing. Yeah, I think it, it's enough to consider small enough. So here in the definition, you can you can take r arbitrarily small, but then the the definition is for every a. Okay, it's a it's a local property. It's a local property, and you can see for by this uh, Laplacian uh, characterization, it is a local property. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. And a very important example of of uh, subharmonic function is the log of the norm of a holomorphic function. This is a singular singular subharmonic function. For instance, the where f vanishes, this is minus infinity. But it's a, it's a very important uh, subharmonic function. So in, in particular, we, we could see that we, subharmonic functions in some sense generalize uh, holomorphic functions. We can, we can embed holomorphic functions in the space of subharmonic functions. But it has the advantage that it's much more flexible than, than holomorphic functions. Okay. And just as a, as a nice uh, formula here for you to, to remember, so the fundamental solution of the Laplacian is log of norm of z. So if we look at the, this uh, distributional characterization, if you take the Laplacian of log Z, we get a distribution uh, that is the direct, the point mass at zero, right? which is very nice. So we have this uh, physical geometric thing that is uh, the point mass at the origin, we can represent by the potential log Z. Okay, so that's the, the name potential theory comes from here. We can, we can represent measures by, by a potential that is, is a, Subharmonic function. So, so what is where, where does U live in general? If it's not uh, it's not smooth, then how do you think of U? It's a measurable function in general. Measurable. And then in, after that, using this property here, you can show that it's actually locally integrable, locally LP for every P. But in the definition, you can take you can take measurable in in the beginning. Okay. okay. Okay, so that's the one dimensional thing. So subharmonic function. Now what, what I'll do, I'll add the name pluri here, but it's a pluri subharmonic function. So a pluri subharmonic function is uh, almost the same definition, but now we know what is a subharmonic function in one dimensional uh, spaces. So what we do now, we take a uh, higher dimensional space, uh, an open set of CK, and we restrict our function to complex lines in this space. So the function will be Pluri subharmonic. If for every line inside this in this domain, we have a subharmonic function in this line here. Okay, in this line here. And as we seen before, this makes sense because it doesn't depend on on, on coordinates, so it's a well-defined notion. Okay. 
And also we can show that this is invariant by, by, by holomorphic maps. So if, if you want to define subharmonic functions in, in CK, we can do it, but it's not a good notion because it's not invariant by, by holomorphic change of coordinates, but plurisubharmonic functions is an invariant notion. That's why it's uh, so important, okay? And now we have, remember that we have the characterization, uh, U is plur, it's subharmonic even only if the Laplacian is positive in the sense of distributions. And here's the higher dimensional generalization. U is uh, PSH, if and only if, DDC of U is a positive closed current. Now this is completely mysterious, right? Because I, we don't know what is, what is DDC. We don't know what, what a current is, what a closed current is, and what is a positive closed current. So sorry, let, let, let me ask you about before, the, I'm trying to understand the game. Yeah. So uh, a subharmonic, you cannot define a subharmonic function on a, on a general smooth manifold because- yes. You can, you can. It depends but... on the coordinates or what? Yeah, in a, in a real manifold you can, or, or in a real space you can. It's, it's a but function you such that the, the value is, is smaller than, than the neighboring in, a, in some sphere, for instance. But it is not invariant under holomorphic maps. So if the, if the transition map is only smooth, then doesn't it? Yeah, this is, not so, this is not, also not a good notion. You can define it in Rn, for instance, but in general manifolds, it's not a good notion. Okay. Okay. So another way of, of defining it's uh, also concept conceptually interesting. You take subharmonic functions on CK. This is a not invariant. It's not an invariant family, but then you take the smallest subfamily that is invariant under by holomorphic maps, and then you get the, the plurisubharmonic functions. Okay. Or the, this picture, I think it's maybe even more natural. You you, you look at one one dimensional one-dimensional lines, and then the restriction subharmonic in this, in this line. Okay. And now we have this uh, big word here, positive closed current, which is the nice characterization of PSH functions, but we don't know what it is. So I will, I will spend the, this slide and the next one explaining what is a current and what is a positive closed current and what, what are these, uh, what is this operator DDC, which is the analog of, of the Laplacian in higher dimensions. Okay. So now you're trying to understand all the all the functions that all the pluri subharmonic functions. That's that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. And and motivating the notion of positive current. Okay. So here's a, just a recap of differential forms. So what is a differential form? A differential form is a is a expression of this type here is a combination of dz and dz bars with smooth functions as coefficients. So if you're not familiar with the complex notation, just uh, here, uh, just a small square here to say how we go from real coordinates to complex coordinates. So here uh, we can split our complex coordinate into pairs of real coordinates. So we have z and z bar. So in a real manifold, the differential form is just a combination of the x's and the y's. It's a combination of, of the x and the y's for all x and y's are co local coordinates with smooth functions as coefficients. And then if you want to go from real coordinates to uh, complex coordinates, you just use this, uh, this change of coordinates here, right? So it's just an alternative way of expressing uh, differential forms that is more adapted to, to complex uh, analysis, okay? So this is a, a differential form and the number of these adds and these at bars that appear here is called the by degree of, of the differential form. So if you have P these adds and Q these at bars, we say that the form has by degree PQ, okay? And then we have uh, two natural operators on, on functions, which is the D and the D bar operator. So the D operators, we take all the derivative with respect to Z, where the definition is this one. And for D bar, we take all the derivatives with respect to DZ, DZ bars and multiply by DZ bars. Okay. And by linearity, we can extend this definition for every, every differential form. Okay. This is uh, standard uh, complex geometry, but uh, yeah, it's standard uh, differential geometry, but now we have complex coordinates which make things a little different. 
like more convenient for for us. Okay. Okay, so we know what what d is. We know what d bar is. So we can uh, form new operators out of it. So this uh, straight d is d plus d bar, which is just the full uh, exterior derivative that we are used to in real analysis. And the dc is the up to uh, multiple. It's uh, the difference of d bar minus d. And then the operator that appears here, ddc, is just i d d bar over pi, okay? So this is the analog of, of the Laplacian in, in dimension one. So if you're in dimension one, this is exactly the Laplace operator. But now, the, since we are in, in many variables, this takes account, uh, uh, it takes into account the Laplacian in every complex direction. Okay. And a definition of form is closed. Maybe you know this, uh, a form is closed if and only if the derivative, the exterior derivative is zero, okay? So to get a feeling of, of uh, those things in, in simple examples, uh, we can think of, we can look at the follow example. If you take a smooth function u and we compute the DDC using these rules here, we obtain the following uh, form of type one, one. And we see that the coefficients here are uh, the coefficient of, of the Hessian uh, matrix of u. Okay, and here we have a hint of what positive means. For instance, in this case, uh, this form here will be positive if this matrix here is a positive definite matrix. Okay, and in a, in a class, uh, a typical and very important example of, of positive form is the Kähler form on, on CK, which is the standard symplectic form on CK. So this is this this is uh, I D D bar of the Z squared function. Okay, many questions? Okay, so let me move to the next uh, slide. So now I get to the, the main uh, object of the talk, well, what is a current? So remember when we talked about uh, subharmonic functions, uh, we characterize, characterize it by saying that the Laplacian of U is a positive distribution. Okay. And now when we replace, uh, so the distribution is the dual space of, of functions, right? of, of compactly supported functions. So when we replace the space of functions by the space of forms, we get the notion of, of current. So what is the current of by degree PQ? Is a linear form, a linear functional that we denote by, by these brackets, T acting on phi, on the space of complementary degree. So if you're in degree dimension K, a PQ current is a linear form on the space of K minus P, K minus Q currents, uh, forms, sorry. Okay, and uh, locally, it's the same expression that a uh, differential form, but instead of having C infinity functions here, we have distributions. Okay, so it's a differential form with uh, distributions as coefficients. Okay, so some uh, typical examples are the following one. A PQ form is a typical example of, of uh, a current because if you have a PQ form, we can multiply it by a K minus P, K minus Q form. We get a form of, of top degree and we can integrate it over X. This gives a, a nice linear functional. Or you, if you think about this local expression, if these are smooth, you get exactly a PQ form. So it's a generalization of PQ forms, just in the same way as the distribution is a generalized, generalized function. Okay. This is the same, same generalization. So it's a singular version of, of forms. So for real manifolds, you can still, this is a sensible notion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everything that I'll talk here makes sense in real manifolds, except when I talk about positivity. So that's where the complex structure is, is crucial. Okay, so that's a very nice smooth uh, current. And the second example is a very singular current. So if you take a submanifold of dimension uh, K minus P, so if, if you have here uh, our manifold X and a submanifold of, of dimension K minus P, we can define uh, a current 
denoted by by uh, v bracket, which is the integration current along v. So we take a k minus p k minus q form, and since oh sorry a k minus p k minus p form, and since it matches with the dimension of the the submanifold, we can integrate. Okay, and here maybe I forgot the, here v is a complex submanifold. Okay, so you see here that the support of this of this uh, first current here is very big. So it typically, is an open set the support of a of a form. But here, the current is very very singular. It, it is zero outside V. So it's a very very singular uh, current. For instance, if you, if you think of a, a measure, for instance, measures are example of, of currents that act on a function. The, this is the uh, analog of the direct mass. V. Okay. okay. And then we can uh, somehow interpolate between these two examples. This will be very important for uh, foliations. So if you have now we have instead of having uh, instead of having one uh, submanifold, if you have a family of submanifolds, for instance, if you have something like this inside our space, and we have a measure on the space parameterizing these manifolds, we can still define a current. So how we do that? So we first integrate our form on a given uh, member of the family. And then if you have a measure on, on this parameter space, we can average all these uh, values together. Okay. And this is a, a very typical example of current that appears uh, quite naturally in dynamics. So if you have a family of, of sub-varieties, for instance, a cloud of sub-varieties, we have an associate and a measure, you, you, you have an associated uh, current, okay? So if X is compact or something, you can, that co then currents become forms or something like this? No, no. Compactness doesn't, okay. no. And it's actually, the, it is uh, very interesting to have singularities. So the singularities looks like, like a bad thing, but it's very useful to, to have singular currents. But say if V is, so I, I, do you have some conditions like V is smooth maybe, then it is a form or? No, no, for instance, if you remember the, the question that I wrote uh, here, uh, this one. So this is a submanifold, right, the, the point zero. And, and the, the current, which is given by this potential, the potential is very singular at zero. So the more singular the, the potential is, more singular the, the current is. And in general, forms won't, won't have a, a support that is uh, too small. Okay? Okay, maybe I should accelerate because I'm barely in the middle. So by duality as uh, for distributions, we can define many operators on distribution just by taking the dual of the operators we have on, on functions, right? You can differentiate distributions and et cetera because we can do it for functions. And here's the same business. Everything, almost everything that we can define for forms, for instance, the operator D, D bar, DC, D, D bar that are defined previously can be transported to currents just by, by duality. For instance, in this example, which is maybe a nice thing, uh, if you if you think of Stokes theorem, this Stokes theorem gives that the differential of the integration current is also an integration current, but along the boundary of V. So we have a very nice analytic way of seeing uh, submanifolds and boundary of submanifolds just by looking at it as a, as a current. So we have. Uh, some analytification of the space of, of some manifolds. Okay. I have a silly question. Why, why is the word current? I mean, it sounds like some variation of a flow. And maybe flow yeah, I think uh, this, I think it was the hum that invented this business. And I think, I think it's motivated by uh, uh, electrostatics and, and stuff like this. But I'm, ah, I'm not a hand, because the potential theory and all these businesses come, the, the language comes from physics. We have charges, masses, potentials, uh, etc. I think it comes from this, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay. But that's not, I mean, it's maybe confusing that you talk about dynamics and sounds like the current is the dynamic. So, but it's not the. 
No, but uh, the last wanted. example it, it, it can be seen as this, but it's not maybe not the best analogy. Yeah. Okay. okay, so as I said, uh, many operations of forms can be transported to currents by duality, but one big uh, issue here is that uh, the wedge product cannot be transferred to currents. This is not a, much of a surprise since we know, for instance, for distributions, we cannot, we cannot always multiply to the distributions. It's a, it's a big issue to multiply them. So here's the same, you cannot always multiply uh, currents. And this is actually a big, big uh, research topic, intersection theory of currents and products of currents. It has many, many applications and uh, I'll mention this uh, in, in the last slides, okay? But it's a warning that we cannot always define this, okay? Okay, moving on. Yeah, I think it will be, still have halfway to go if it's okay for everyone. If you need me to accelerate, please, please tell me. I think it's fine. I mean, we, we, we didn't set an end time, so. Okay, yeah. I shouldn't have promised one hour because people will be disappointed. <laughs> okay, so remember that we want to, know what is a positive closed current because that's what characterizes pluri-subharmonic functions in higher dimensions. So I talked about uh, positive uh, about currents that we know already what it is. It's this generalized version of the forms. And uh, we know what, it, what closed means, right? Closed, since we know how to compute dt, closed means that dt is, is zero. Okay, for instance, here in this example, a the, a submanifold will always define a close. Well, it will always define a closed current as long as it has no boundary. Okay. So the only missing word here is now a positivity. So what is a positive uh, current? So this is the I think the most remarkable fact of, of this theory is that the, the currents in complex uh, manifolds, currents of degree PP, have a, a notion of positivity that is intrinsic. Okay. I'll, I'll define it only for k equals two for, for two dimensional complex manifolds because it's easier to, to understand. So the definition works in, in any dimension. So we start uh, slowly. So what is a positive zero zero form? So a zero zero form is just a function, right? Form of degree zero is just a function. So the definition is trivial. A positive uh, zero zero form is just a non-negative function. And then to get the corresponding notion for, for currents, we just dualize just as uh, for distributions, right? So uh, a current, a positive two, two current is uh, actually a positive distribution. It's a distribution, it's a current that tests positive for every positive function, okay? And this, is, this doesn't use a complex structure. So we can also always define what, a comp what is a positive distribution. Now, what is a positive one-one form? Uh, as I maybe gave the hint before, a positive one-one form is a form that locally writes uh, as uh, sum of a i j d z i d z h d d z j bar, where the matrix appearing here is a positive definite uh, Hermitian matrix. Okay, so this is the the good notion of positivity for one-one forms that is invariant under holomorphic change of coordinates. And then by dualizing, so when we dualize, so here the dimension is two, right? So we, we go from zero to two by du duality. And now here we go from one, one to one, one or K minus one in higher dimensions. And if you, if you know what a positive form is, we know what a positive current is just by duality. So current is positive if and only if it tests positive for every one, one form, okay. Maybe test positive is not a good word in the current situation. <laughs> yeah. Maybe for the benefit of some people, uh, just say a few words. But the distribution is not as scary as it sounds, right? It's just a linear function of, of functions. Right? Yes, I mentioned this, but maybe I can say it again. A distribution is a, is a yeah, it's a linear function on the space of, of functions. So here I'm talking about something that takes a form and, and gives a number. And here, uh, distribution uh, takes a function and, and, and spits out a number, okay? So, so would it be right just to uh, take, uh, 
from the stock that currents are uh, the dual space of differential forms. <laughs> yes, yes. That's what I, yeah, what I wrote somewhere. Yeah, but that is the dual space of differential, differential forms, yeah. Okay. And dual in, in also, we also, uh, what is important for instance distributions is it's a generalized notion of functions. We allow singularities and, and for currents is the same. It's a, it's a form that can be singular. Okay. Okay, so that's the notion of, of positivity in, for one one uh, forms, just that this matrix is positive definite and by duality is uh, the function uh, current is positive if the, when applied to such forms, it is positive. And to end, uh, what is a positive two to form? So since we are in dimension two, this uh, 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 two to form is of top degree. So it, it has to be a multiple of the volume form of, of your manifold, right? So, and then a uh, positive two to form is just uh, a positive volume form. And by duality, uh, positive zero, zero currents uh, are zero, zero currents. So functions that tests uh, positive against positive uh, volume forms. So here and here, uh, here and here, it seems that we have the, almost the same uh, notion. But what is important is that here we allow singular functions. For instance, every measurable locally integrable function is a positive volume current, but it's not a it's a positive zero zero current. But it's not a form because it, it's not smooth in general. Okay. So I've, everything in this side here is allowed to be singular. Okay. So some uh, examples. So if you didn't get the, the definition, you can maybe remember the the example. So the, the first important example oh, are, are so, so positive and non-negative is the same here, right? Is the same, yeah. This is uh, should, should be written non-negative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the French policy. Okay, so so some uh, important examples are Kähler forms. So Kähler forms are, are functions such that this matrix is actually strictly uh, it's positive definite, not same definite. So our, our closed forms that are locally like this, and they are, they are symplectic forms. Uh, they are uh, important in, in differential geometry and in, in symplectic geometry. Okay, and the currents of integration. Uh, if you remember, I, def uh, I defined earlier. If you have a manifold, sub manifold, you have an associated current, and these currents are also uh, always positive. And uh, we have some flexibility. Uh, all these notions are preserved under averaging and limits. So if you have a family of positive things, if, if you average, we still have positive things. And if you have limits, in some sense, you also have, okay? And now hopefully we can understand this proposition. A function is uh, PSH, plus harmonic, if and only if this current here is a positive closed uh, form on current in this sense here. So this is the analog of the, the Laplace uh, operator in, in higher dimensions. Okay. Okay, I think that's all for this section. So if you have questions, maybe it's the time to, to ask. No? Okay, so let's uh, slow things down a little bit and go back to to dynamics, or oh, there's a typo here, it's endomorphisms. So now I'll, I'll say uh, how uh, currents, these things that we just uh, we have just seen, appears in, in, in dynamics of endomorphisms of PK and uh, laminations. Okay, so recall that uh, a holomorphic self map of uh, PK is always given by homogeneous polynomials. So if this is too scary, you can uh, always remember the case of. of uh, one dimension, uh, okay. So we can think this is a particular case of, of the holomorphic map of, of PK. So we have a dynamical system that is given by polynomial uh, polynomial functions. So a couple of definitions, D, which is the, the common degree of these polynomials, uh, I'll call the topological degree of F, uh, sorry, the algebraic degree of F. And the topological degree of F, which is the number of pre-images of a given point, is 
d to the power k, where k is the dimension. Okay. So if you take any point in pk and you count how many points are mapped to it, we will get exactly d to the k. Okay. So uh, what is uh, very interesting here in this business is that we have uh, canonical invariant uh, currents. So we have, for every map F, we have a single uh, current associated to F that is uh, invariant by the dynamics and gives many, many things about the, the dynamics. So I'll try to explain a little bit how, how to construct these, these currents and then what are the interesting properties about it. So first, first I would like to start with the definition. There's a, a nice uh, form in PK that is called the Fubini Studi form on, on PK, which is just the DDC of log Z when you when you pull back to the to the CK plus one that is above it. Okay, There's, there is just one definition. Another way, if you're more of a geometer, PK has a transitive action of the unitary group uh, UK plus one. And this is basically the only the only invariant uh, Roman form. Okay. So this is a canonical. It's the canonical uh, form in, in in PK. Okay. But if you don't like it, in a minute you can forget it because it's not very relevant that we start with this form for what follows. So now I will, I will show you how to construct a canonical uh, invariant uh, one one current. Let me interrupt you for a second. Uh, yep. I get uh, s several people wrote write me privately that uh, they like the talk but they need to go yeah. now and if it's okay, okay. They do, if they see the recording later so let me yes let okay. me ask okay. if you're satisfied so far and you you're okay with, with posting yes right? i'm satisfied but maybe okay. dean will not be because i need to introduce some stuff in the end but okay. yeah okay go on sorry okay so maybe I will skip some stuff uh, to be a little bit faster. I think it's fine because <laughs> those people are leaving now and then so okay. they will be happy to see it in a, in a relaxed way. Okay, okay. May, may I ask, uh, so it, it, I don't understand about how it can be such canonical invariance, say if P is equal to K, then such an invariant, it should be some, just some multiple of the volume form, right? And no, if you have uh, a... Oh, and we have a map of large degree, not degree one, and it cannot uh, uh, preserve such a form. Yes, I see your point. Yeah. So yeah. So for instance, if if p equals k, uh, so we start with the volume form, but uh, as I'll explain in a minute, uh, we will iterate these things under the dynamics. So in the limit, this form will be distorted, and in the limit, we'll get, we'll get a measure on a singular measure on pk that is not the the volume form. And this singular measure is preserved by with the dynamics. Is oh, that okay. here? Okay. Yeah, so how we produce this uh, invariant current. So we start with a given form. It can be this one, but if you don't like this one, we can start with any, any one one form up to just a small normalization. So we start with any one one form. So we take the pre-images of this one one form, you pull it back by your map f and then we iterate this and then we know you normalize by this factor that is i'll explain in a minute that is the, the right factor okay so we take for instance you can think this as a as a as a for instance if in dimension one you can think of this as a just a mass distribution on p1 we take any mass distribution p1 that is, is smooth enough and we take the pre-images and normalize it and then we get this uh, canonical limit here and this limit is a canonical uh, invariant moment current that we call the green current. Okay. Is that clear? So the, the, uh, there are two important points. One is that the, the, this limit exists. And the other one is that it doesn't depend on, on the starting form alpha. So we put, if you put alpha here, any alpha will give the same limit. So that's the, the meaning of canonical. Okay. So why do you take this one? Because it's a nice one that uh, I hoped people would know. And it's, it's the more, more symmetric uh, one, but you can take any one. Yeah. As a, what, what would happen if you take some, I don't know, not a PP core, something else? 
Yeah, so this is a one one current, right? This is a one one form. So if you take a PP form, we still have a canonical limit, but this is much, much harder to prove. But what if it's like two zero, then it won't converge or what? Uh, it can cover, but it's, it's not interesting because uh, the cohomology of PK, PK is it's concentrated in degree PP. So if you, so, you can take you can take any uh, projective variety and apply this construction, right? If you have yes. a from the projective variety to itself. Yes, yes, but it's uh, it's a very good question, but and it's not clear that we have uh, a nice limit, because as I just told Max, the the cohomology of PK is, is very easy, and the action of F in cohomology is very easy. But if you have general uh, varieties, the the cohomology is already hard, and the action cohomology can be also hard. But it's a very interesting question. It's in many people work on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think I'll skip the proof of this. <laughs> I, I, I prepared one proof that is the next slide, but I think I'm way uh, out of time. So I'll, I'll skip the proof. So just a hint of the proof or, or, or what, it, what it uses. You don't need to, to memorize it. But it's, uh, as, I, as I told you, it involves the cohomology of, of PK and that fact that the action of F on cohomology is just multiplication by D. And then an uh, uh, important fact about uh, killer manifolds is that you, you can uh, relate uh, cohomologous forms by, by functions. And then we, if you iterate this procedure, we will get the, the definition of T. But uh, if you don't like this, we we'll just forget about it. Yeah, so what, what is the relation between currents and cohomology? Yeah, so this is the Deham cohomology, right? If you have a closed form, So we have a cohomology class, right? Something that lives in H uh, dr of, of K, where K is the degree of the form, right? This is the space of closed, closed forms, mod exact forms. So then currents is just the- Currents is the same. We have a, the D operator. So we have the, the space of closed currents, mod uh, exact currents. And we actually get the same space. If you consider currents of forms, we get the same the run space. Okay. okay. So in the level of cohomology, forms and currents are, are the same. Okay. So these are the key uh, facts about the about PK that I that I use, and here's the one line proof. But you, you don't need to bother. Huh? But what yeah, what I want to stress is that we have a well defined limit that is independent of the starting uh, form. Okay. And then almost uh, by construction, we have this very nice uh, invariance. So if you pull it back the current, we get the current itself mod uh, the scaling factor, okay? Another fact is that the functions that we obtain as limits are pluri-subharmonic functions that are not arbitrary. They are very regular, they're continuous or, or even uh, holder continuous. And why I'm telling this, because uh, I told you, uh, some slides ago that we cannot always define wedge products of, of this type, right? The T wedge T is not always well defined, but in this particular case, since the current is nice, meaning that it's not that singular having continuous potentials, this is a well-defined uh, current for every P. So this is how we, we construct uh, higher degree uh, currents from the one one current to just take the wedge product with itself uh, P times, okay? And the more interesting, most interesting case is maybe when P is the top uh, degree, so the dimension of, of the manifold. And then we get a canonical invariant measure uh, for the dynamics, which is the green measure. And we can show that it's the new unique measure of maximal entropy, if you know what this is. So we, what I'm trying to say is that we use current and pluripotential theory to produce invariant objects, and in particular to produce a single canonical invariant measure for, for the dynamical system. And this is quite special among dynamical systems. We cannot hope for this uh, for general real uh, dynamical systems, for instance, right? So that's one example of the power of, of pluripotential theory, okay? And another uh, important word here is uh, Julia said. So if you look at the support of this current, so where the, where the current uh, doesn't vanish, 
uh, we have the notion of Julia set, which is uh, where the chaotic behavior of, of, of the dynamics uh, occur. Okay. Uh, can you uh, say, for example, if you have your first example with a circle and the dynamical system, which is the z to z square, yeah. what is the, uh, this uh, invariant measure, how it looks this like? Is, in this is the hard measure on, on the circle, as I told you in the very first slide. There is but, a, yeah. Remember that every uh, point except infinity and, and, and zero converge to the circle. No, I mean, if we, if we, if we restrict it to, to the circle, then what the measure of the circle? Because the hard measure, it, if you take uh, this map, it takes our measure to twice the measure, I think. Yeah. So, hey, that's so exactly this is the question here, this. So yes, but so, so what is the, what is, ah. Ah, I see. So T is not, in fact, invariant. It is invariant up to that. Uh, yes, invariant in this sense. Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So the mass. So the mass of the measure is multiplied by d at d to the k at every step mm -hmm. on the back part iteration. So if you take a point, the pre image will be d to the k points. So we have uh, the mm -hmm. mass is multiplied. Okay, okay. So that was better at me from the start. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, so we know uh, a little bit about currents and what are the, why they are important because they are canonical invariant objects for the dynamics. And I'll just show very quickly uh, two uh, theorems that say how uh, nice these currents are. So how they're useful to, to give information about the dynamics. So the first one is uh, the following, is a theorem from, uh, this uh, bunch of people. So outside some uh, exceptional set of uh, PK, we have the following convergence. If you take uh, any point outside this bad set and we look at all the pre-images and we iterate, it will converge to the canonical measure, just as the, the answer to the question that I was just asked. So for instance, in this example, uh, let us come back to the example of the first slide. If you take any point, except, so here E is uh, zero infinity. So if you take any point except uh, the origin and infinity, if you look at the pre-images, they will accumulate uh, with respect to the hard measure in the, in the unit circle. And what is striking here is that this phenomena, here we know by almost explicit computation, but this is very generally works for any map in any uh, projected space. What is the co-dimension of this sub subset E? It can be any co-dimension, yeah. Typically is, is empty. So if you take a generic map F, the set uh, epsilon is empty. But for instance, here is co-dimension one. And then if you take uh, this map here in higher dimensions, uh, Z1, D, Z2, D, et cetera, you have, uh, you have K, K hyperplanes, so it can be of co-dimension one and, and empty. Okay. There are many, many important conjectures about this set that is still unknown, but I won't get to that, okay? But what I, what I want to say is that this measure describes the backward orbit of almost uh, every point. So this uh, object that we constructed using pluripotential theory actually gives very precise uh, information about the dynamics. And this convergence is not simple convergence of measures. It can, it can be quantified in, in many different ways. Okay, and a, a higher uh, dimensional analog of this. So instead of starting with a point and iterating backwards, if we start with a, with a hypersurface of, of PK and iterate it backwards, unless we are in uh, some bad situation that, that touches some exceptional set like here, we also have convergence towards T. So the idea is that T de describes the backward orbit of any uh, hypersurface of PK. Okay. This is, this is very strong. So the backward dynamics is, is very regular and it, it's basically governed by, by this current T that we constructed. 
But I'm confused. Was it, what was the definition of tea? I thought you said that like by definition you, you take. Yeah, so very, very good question. So the definition of tea, we start with, uh, let me go back, with forms, smooth forms. So here, alpha is a closed one, one smooth form. So if you start with a smooth thing, we all, it, it's by, the, by, by this uh, proposition, we all always have the same limit, okay? But the problem is that we get singular uh, currents. Okay. okay. Right? For instance, in this example of, of the circle, we have a counterexample, right? If you take the direct mass at the origin, this is a very singular current. And if you iterate backwards, we stay there forever. So we, we don't have convergence. And the whole, the whole proof is exactly uh, treating the singularities uh, of V and, and, and the pre-images. So it's like about the dynamics very, very of, a, of a hypersurface. Or something. Sorry? It's like the dynamics of a hypersurface moving around. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So if you take a line, if you take the pre-image, we have a degree D uh, curve. And if you keep it iterating and normalizing, this will, will converge to T. Okay. This is also nice to, to see that a, a current is uh, a limit of, of some manifolds. So this is also a way of compactifying the space of, of some manifolds. If you take a limit of some manifold, it's not a, a sub manifold, but uh, it is a, a current. Okay, so this is also interesting uh, per se. Okay. And just to finish, I have uh, an example here, but I won't spend too, too much time on it. Maybe I'll even skip it, but just a picture of how this one dimension example that I just uh, talked about, about z to the power two, generalizes to, to higher dimensions. So the picture is more or less like this. So the current T here will be supported by this line here when you look in the space of uh, norms, norm z and norm w. So the support will be this uh, set here. And the measure, the, the canonical measure, will be supported by this set here. And if you look uh, closely, this set here, z equals w equals t in some affine charge, this is a two-dimensional torus. Okay, so this is the natural net generalization of the z uh, to the z to the power two map. And here, what, what we get is the hard measure in this uh, two-dimensional torus. Okay. So if you iterate this map, this map here backwards, everything except a few exceptions will converge to the hard measures on the two-dimensional torus. Okay, but if we have even more than that. We have also co-dimension one phenomena that can be described by by T. That happens around here. Okay. So even in this example, that's only a corollary of this uh, complicated theorem. It's not a simple. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the extribution of points is simple because it's just the previous example coordinate by coordinate. But then for for curves, it's it, I don't think there's a elementary proof. Okay. Okay. I think that's all for the dynamics of maps. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I have three more slides. Is that okay, everyone? I think it's good if we got so far. <laughs> okay, yeah, because the three, uh, no, so the next three slides will talk about laminations and foliations, and this is exactly the theme of, of the next talk. So maybe you have a feeling of other types of currents that appear in the dynamics of foliation. So now we have, we have this current T, now we have uh, different uh, types of, of currents that you also are also. Sorry? I think it's interesting to see your other slide. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, now let's talk about lamination. So remember that in the beginning, I split uh, dynamical systems into discrete and continuous. Uh, the examples that I told you before are uh, discrete, and now we are talking about continuous uh, dynamical systems. So what is a lamination? So the definition might look ugly, but the, the picture might be more uh, clear. So what is a lamination? A lamination is uh, a, like a continuous flow. So it's a, it's a gluing of, of flow boxes, like pic local pictures like this. So if you have uh, two charts that is a product 
of a disk of dimension Q and some transversal sets Ki. So here I have uh, Kj and here I have uh, Ki. So if I glue these uh, two pictures in a consistent way, we have a, a, a space that calls, it's called a lamination or laminated space. So if I glue them, I have a space that looks uh, like this. So in one chart, we, chart we have the, the green uh, leaves and then we can glue it with uh, the yellow leaves. Okay. So, the, so this part here corresponds to this chart and this part here corresponds to this chart. Okay. And what the definition is saying is just that the, this uh, change of coordinates preserve this, this picture here. So if you are in a, in a leaf here and we, we go from here to here and from here to here, we end up in a leaf here. Okay. So the, the map has this form here. So the, the last coordinate here is only depending on G. Okay. So that's a foliation. It's a gluing of these parallel uh, unions of, of K dimensional disks. Okay. For instance, a vector field. So main examples, if you take a vector field, it's a standard exercise that you can always straighten your vector field to look like this uh, in a suitable coordinate system, unless the vector field vanishes. And then you have a, a singular, uh, singular uh, lamination that I won't talk about, okay? Another important example is a complex submanifold. This is a, a, a very singular uh, example. So if you have a complex submanifold, V like this, this is a trivial example of, of, maybe you can continue like this. This is a trivial example of lamination because we can take uh, this uh, transverse set to be just a singleton. Right? So locally, every submanifold looks like this and this is a boring example of, of uh, lamination, okay? Where you have only one, one leaf, is that clear? Another example that is more interesting, we can take uh, closures of leaves of foliation. For instance, if you take a vector field and look at its orbit, by example one, this gives a uh, foliation, but we can also take the closure of this stuff. So if you take the closure of a picture like this, we, we get also a picture like this, but with a fattened uh, transversal. Okay. So we, this is interesting because we can study the limit sets of, of foliations uh, by, by laminations. So the limit set of uh, a vector field of foliation is naturally a, a laminated set, but it can be very complicated. For instance, this transversal here could be a counter set or some weird stuff. What you call leaves is, is this uh, multi disk or how it's called? Yeah, so the leaves is the, the analytic continuation of this thing. So, so in this local picture, this, uh, the, the green part and the yellow part are, are disjoint. But if you follow, this is a very good question. So if you follow uh, one green part here, or you keep gluing charts and charts, we can, you, might, you might come back to a different, uh, different green leaf here. Mm. And the leaf is this, uh, the right thing that I, that I drew. So even if the local picture is trivial, the global picture is, 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 it can be quite mysterious. You can, you can accumulate everywhere or stuff like this. So it's a continue. So, I mean, where, what is the function that you can Analytically continue. You continue the, the submanifold. So we have a ah, there's a glue of continuing a map. Yeah, you, you you glue you glue the, the local submanifolds. Okay. So these are the main examples. This one maybe is too technical, won't talk about it. Uh, Levy flat hypersurfaces. And there's a big and important conjecture that uh, challenged many people is uh, the following: there is no compact lamination in P2 except the curve. So as I told you, the submanifolds are, are examples of laminations, but except this trivial example, there are no, no examples. And this is a particular case of two big uh, conjectures. One is non-existence of Levy flats that uh, I don't want to talk about it. And also non-existence of minimal exceptional sets for foliation. So it's basically, a, if this conjecture is true, we have a classification of all possible limit sets of, of foliations, okay. And this is a very challenging problem. There are, there are proofs, and this is true in higher dimension. And for instance, this is uh, well known in higher dimension, but there are some false proofs by many known mathematicians that, uh, for the case of P2. 
So it's a, it's a yeah, tough problem. But what I mean to say is that uh, we don't even know if these objects exist in UMP2 and, and maybe studying uh, currents uh, on them can, can help, but uh, I don't know. Okay, so how do currents appear in this uh, picture? So remember that we have uh, this local picture of a flow box. So every lamination looks uh, like this, locally at least, okay? With some transverse set here that parameterizes the, the local leaves, okay? And remember that uh, if you have a piece of submanifold, we can associate a current, right? It's the integration current on the submanifold. And I also told you that if you have a family of submanifolds and a measure on this family, we can average all these, all these uh, currents. So that's the definition of, of uh, directed currents. It's this, this definition here. So a directed current is an average of such plaques where we have some weights in this uh, transversal set, Ki. Okay. And if you want to make this consistent with the change of coordinates in the local charts, we have to require that the measures are invariant by, by this uh, rule here, okay? So this is the natural notion of invariant measure for, for foliation. So we have a measure on each transversal Ki, and when we follow this and we add in another Kj, we get the same, we get the same measure. So it's a measure that is uh, constant along the flow. That's the idea. So again, the things that you are averaging on, it's not just a disk, but a continuation of the disk, so that it becomes- Yeah, so the, the, the space Ki here can be anything. It can be a counter set, it can be a point, it can be another disk of complementary dimension. So have a lot of freedom for the, the transverse space. What we require is just the, in the horizontal direction, we have a holomorphic disk. And that's where the complex structure comes from. Transversely, we have no complex structure, but we have this holomorphic disk, okay? So what is a, so a, a foliation cycle is a, it's a positive closed current and here the, the degree of the current is uh, k minus k minus q the degree k minus q k minus q because it's the co-dimension of of the disk that is given by an average of local leaves of this form. Okay, and this makes sense uh, globally if they satisfy this uh, invariance uh, relation. So it's the, this is the natural analog of invariant measure for elimination. Okay, cool. So it's uh, good news. We have a very good notion of very measure so we can study, but bad news is that they don't exist in general. So we have, if you have this very natural notion of, of invariant measure, uh, we can prove this is a, a part of uh, work that I did in my PhD thesis, uh, generalizing the work of Fournette and Sibuddi in dimension two. For instance, if the ambient space is PK, we cannot find invariant measures. So we cannot find uh, directed closed currents. And there are many other examples. And, and the reason is that we have this uh, cohomological obstruction for the existence. So since the leaves are parallel, we can make sense of this intersection that I told you that it's not always well-defined, but using intersection theory of currents, we can show that this THT is well-defined and it's actually zero. And since the cohomology of PK is simple enough, we can, we can show that this uh, cannot happen. So we have topological obstructions for the existence of invariant measures for uh, laminations. So, it's, uh, so again, maybe I missed it in the last slide. You think of T as some kind of uh, result of some dynamics? Yeah, so uh, if you think like this is just a current, an average of local leaves. But if you think using this uh, invariance relation, it means that if you follow one local leaf along all the charts, when you hit another transversal, you have the same measure. But so formally, it's how do you define the dynamics? That this is something. This, this formally, is the, it's like following the leaves. So if you if you're in a leaf like this, you glue with the next chart here, and then you follow the, the next leaf. That that's the dynamics. But is there like a, I don't know? Is is this the dynamic defined by the foliation? Or? Yeah, this is yeah yeah. When when the parameter when we are in uh, for 
in real foliations, we have R, and then that it's trivial what it makes, what it means. But this is a generalized notion of, of uh, dynamical system. Yeah. And the time here is, is, is the disk or, or the C, C to the cube. Okay, so it's a complex multidimensional complex time. time. Yeah, <laughs> complex multidimensional time. Yeah. Okay. And here's the final slide. So as I said, it's uh, good news that we have a good notion, but it's bad news but that the notion is not found in, in nature. And this uh, is uh, so done by, yep. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, you mean the Q current, the foliation with the dimension of leaves more or equal to K uh, half, right? Yeah, yeah. So you use the, the, uh, the in, in, in dimension to Q, you have no uh, cohomology of your projective space, right? And yeah, but uh, here the, 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 the degree of the current is K minus Q, so it's, it's complementary. So, so this is exactly, I get your point, exactly to mean that this lives in a non-trivial space. So the degree of the current is, is low enough and the dimension, the dimension is complementary to the degree. Are there any non-trivial examples in uh, smaller, for smaller Q? I think so. Yes, there are, there are. Because you can, you can take a, yeah, because you have philosophically, if you take like, for instance, P to 100, is a very big space, and then you can fit a one dimensional, uh, you can have uh, a lot well, of freedom to contrast one just dimensional. Not intersect, but it, it will be just non intersecting uh, sub manifolds, or it could be something. Yeah, lo locally, yes, locally, yes. So we have examples in, in low, low dimension. I mean, the, the examples that are not just a union of some non-intersecting uh, submanifolds. Yes, there are examples. Yeah, wait, locally, it's, it's always like this, right? But the globally, but globally. The, the examples are non-trivial. Yeah, there are non-trivial oh. examples. Thank you. There's a book by, if you want to know, there's a book by Etienne Gis that has a lot of examples. This is the classical one and uh, some survey by Nguyen from this year. And they, maybe you can find examples there. Okay. Are there any uh, continuous examples? I, I mean, no, in, in non-complex, non-colomorphic case, you can have just your space, just, uh, uh, just uh, make it as the union of leaves, something like that. And are there anything uh, similar in the complex case? Yes, there's some analogs of these uh, theorems uh, in, in the real case by Herder, I think Herder, Mitsumatsu, and uh, Sullivan. So maybe you can uh, ask me later. I can give you the precise uh, references. But th there are some real analogs of, of this but for, for no, affiliations. I, yeah. I, I mean, the other way around. Uh, for in the complex space, are there yeah. some. Uh, some things that can be locally look like the K is uh, not just a discrete set, but uh, say... Uh, Continuous one? Yes, something like that. Yeah, so that's the case of foliations. For instance, if you take a foliation given by a vector field, the transverse fills the whole space, right? For instance, if you take a, a torus, you can foliate it by parallel subtori or if you take a submersion, for instance, the fibers give a, give a foliation and then the transverse is... is, is the ah, okay, so you, so you can take, say, uh, uh, in your projective space, you can take submanifold, which can be uh, foliated, and then you have such an example. Yes, right. yes. So yeah, that's a also a very good point. You can also prove, for instance, that tori cannot be embedded in, in, in PK by using this. So if you have something that is foliated, this also gives an obstruction of, of embedding this foliated stuff in, in PK, in local dimension. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we're almost there. So we have bad news, but to end with uh, some good news, because we need it in 2020. So there's a, a natural substitute of, of foliation cycles that uh, do exist always. And this is a directed harmonic currents. 
So if you remember my origin definition, we had no, no uh, coefficient here, but if you allow a harmonic function uh, as a weight in every flake, so if you allow HT to be a positive harmonic function on each uh, flake or local leaf, and we define a directed harmonic current like this. So this is, uh, Dean will talk about it. I hope he, he motivates more than, than uh, I do, but this is a generalized notion that, uh, of a current that is uh, not closed. So we don't have uh, this in general, but we have uh, that DDC is of T is zero. Okay. So it's not as good, but it's, it's uh, good enough. And it's also a very interesting object. It's related to the to the Brownian motion along the leaves. It's a very beautiful topic, but I, you know, unfortunately, I don't have time to to talk about it. But my, my the upshot is that even we don't have uh, foliation cycles that satisfy this. If you allow harmonic uh, counterparts, we always have. So this is a theorem by Garnett in, in eighty three and Burton Siboney uh, uh, more recently that for one dimensional leaves, we always, even with singularities that I don't didn't talk about, but even if we allow singularities, all, every uh, lamination of dimension one admits currents like this. And this is the good analog of invariant measure for, for foliations. This, this is the main object that will replace the green current. So the equidistribution theorems and ergodicity, et cetera, will be with respect to this single, or this, uh, this uh, DDC closed harmonic currents. So there's a choice of making uh, HTs or how? What, no, what it can it can be it can be any any harmonic low harmonic function on the on the plate. Okay, and when, when they are constant, we fall in the, into into this case here that typically doesn't exist. Okay. And I think that's all. I'm very sorry for being that late, but yeah, let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think many people left because they have a class starting uh, earlier. That's yeah, expected, but they can watch the recording. So thank mm -hmm. you very much. I, think I enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm very sorry. I really misjudged the time, but uh, since you said that I, I was free, so oh, no, don't be sorry. I, I used I used that freedom. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think we are ready for uh, Dean's talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, I hope next talk will be a little bit easier, or at least more.